My name is Gary Hemming. I've been a software developer at the European Gravitational Observatory and member of the Virgo Collaboration for more than 15 years. Uh, and I'm the technical manager of the Reinforce project. I'm standing in this morning for, for Stavros Katsanevas, the EGO director, who is due to be leading the session this morning, but is unfortunately unavailable. Although uh, knowing Stavros, I wouldn't be surprised if he joined us at some point uh, during the morning. Uh, I'm going to uh, give a brief introduction, talk a little bit about what the, the Reinforce project is all about. So it's uh, a project that receives funding from the European Union under the auspices, uh, auspices of the Science With and For Society uh, funding uh, programme. And it's been designed with the aim of bringing large scale research infrastructures and society closer together through citizen science. So what are, what are the goals of the, the project? Um, the project aims to engage and to support citizens, to help them to actively cooperate with researchers and in so doing to, to contribute directly to the, the development of new knowledge. Um, it looks to explore the potential of frontier citizen science, nurturing a, a two-way process between researchers on, on the one hand uh, and citizens on the other, um, and in so doing to, to forge interdisciplinary connections and, and to explore multimodal understandings of, uh, of reality, so for, for example via both image and sound. It wants to go beyond established traditional discipline frontiers in terms of the way in which we, we understand reality and, and to explore the interface between art and science, developing critical thinking in, in, in this world that's moving ever further towards uh, increased digital connectivity and remote working and experience. And underlying all of this is a multi-sensorial approach to the concept of the cosmos. So uh, to go beyond its contemporary sense and to return to its, its original meaning. So to see the world and all about it as a, a perfectly ordered and harmonious system. So Reinforce treats the universe, the earth, society, and the individual as, as part of the same whole. So how are we going to reach these, these goals, these very ambitious goals? Um, so citizen scientists will participate in online frontier science across a range of fields. So analyzing both real and simulated data produced by some of the most advanced detectors in the world. The project will implement a, a participatory and inclusive design, which aims to encourage people from many different groups to actively contribute, providing for sonification of data for visually impaired people, virtual training workshops for people in rural areas, specialized ICT training workshops for senior citizens and students and educators in secondary education, among many others. And on the basis of the experiences that are garnered during the project, a policy roadmap will, will also be developed. While at the core of the project is the development of large scale citizen science demonstrators, which, about which we will hear much more shortly. We've got a number of important infrastructures involved in the project. Again, we'll, we shall see uh, more, more, we will receive more information about these as we, as we look at the demonstrators. In terms of tools, Reinforce leverages the Zooniverse platform, which, through which it will build its infrastructure and engage with its community. Uh, Zooniverse is already an, an immensely successful research tool in its own right, and allowing citizen scientists to concentrate on playing a full role in scientific exploration. And a dedicated sonification software, Sono Uno, is also being developed within the project, based on the direct experiences of experts in the field. It aims to provide a groundbreaking approach to scientific data analysis. The truly international group of partners is extremely rich, covering multiple sectors and providing expertise and experience in many, many different fields. So ultimately, Reinforce perceives citizen science as a participatory process, an amalgam of contributory and co-created science in which citizens are trained in frontier science, in constant interaction with researchers through their communities of practice. Through the use of open data, scientists go beyond tasks generated by researchers for the benefit of science and are able to perform their own inquiries. And with the guidance of experts in their respective fields, they can provide their feedback, they voice their concerns, and they explore the boundaries of knowledge. So I've given you a very brief and broad outline. Let's move on now and have a look at the project in detail. 
We've got a very rich lineup this morning for you and a, a relatively short time frame. So uh, all our contributors will be, uh, I'm sure, will, will adhere uh, concisely to their allocated times. If you have any questions, then please feel free to post them on the chat and uh, we'll try and ask one or two as we switch between uh, one presentation and another. So I will stop sharing my screen and we'll pass to uh, Manolis for the first one. Yes. I believe you're up first. Thank you very much, Gary. So, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to, to welcome each and every one of you to our web. We are very happy to have you. My name is Manolis Kanyotakis. I am a physicist and a researcher in the Elino Germaniki Agogi School Research and Development Department. In uh, the framework of Rainforce, we are responsible for the citizen science engagement strategy of the. So, this is what we are going to discuss in the following minutes together. So, we have some questions. And the question is the first one How can citizens contribute to frontier science? And the second one is the quite, uh, you know, the opposite. How can frontier science contribute to the well being of society? You see, in Rainforce, what we are trying to achieve is to bridge the gap between large research infrastructures in physics and society through citizen science. Here you see this graphic on the left, you can see the infrastructures and experiments that participate in our approach, and on the right you see society. So the question is, what can we do for each other? Through citizen science, we expect to help increase society science capital, bring people closer to scientific research and uh, support the uh, solutions uh, to societal problems. While we hope and we expect society, on the other hand, to contribute in the production of new knowledge and uh, maybe instill the culture of democratization in science as uh, we, we dream. So, does this approach work? because we are discussing some very sophisticated experiments, some very uh, cutting edge physics. So does this work? Can citizens really support this? Can this really work? So we have a case study from a previous citizen science project, which is also running as well, Gravity Spy. So what you see here, I am not the expert to talk to you about this, but just wanted to give you an overview. This shows how far in the universe a gravitational wave antenna can look. But due to uh, noise triggers that make their way in the data, uh, we have dead time in the detector and they mimic the gravitational wave signal. So you see that a detector that could see almost a, a distance of 50 megaparsec in the universe, at some points this is reduced to 15, for example, due to these glitches. And these glitches look something like this in our uh, data. So. Imagine that a gravitational wave passes through our We take other kind of noise, these glitches. So in Gravity Spy, citizens classify glitches according to their characteristics and communicate their findings to scientists and try to help them uh, fix, let's say, optimize this uh, research infrastructure. Scientists, from their part, uh, recognize the contribution of the citizens in uh, this effort. And citizens, on the other hand, uh, who have participated, say that this is a very cooperative community and they are very motivated to join because they want to contribute to this, they want to help. Their effort is recognized. For example, a citizen um, discovered a whole new set of uh, glitches and uh, help scientists uh, fix specific problems that existed. So, citizen science, as stated before by Gary, so I will pass it uh, quickly. For us, it's a participatory process. It's not uh, that we have the experts and the audience and we have a one-way communication process. It's something that we do together. We ask for your help, your contribution, your support in this one. We offer training in uh, these fields through our uh, demonstrator activities. We offer the connection, the communication means in order to help us explore these boundaries of knowledge. So, 
let me tell you now that in order to attract, in order to engage and in order to sustain the participation of uh, society in rainforest, there is um, research that uh, is in progress. The, this is the role of the citizen science engagement strategy of the project. So we have some questions that we need to answer in order to design our projects in the optimal way that will facilitate our contribution and our collaboration. So, the first question is, who are the potential citizen scientists that can be engaged in rainforest? How do we find them? Do we design citizen science projects for an exclusive set of a few interested citizens or do we design for inclusion? This is something very important because sometimes we need to think about how we can balance scientific efficiency because uh, we it is science that we will do and we want to balance inclusion we want everyone to have to participate because everyone has different skills everyone has different points of view and we need these points of view to aggregate them and produce the optimal output what are, so we are investigating what are the design characteristics necessary to achieve this balance we have different target groups with different boundaries we have uh, citizens from a broad spectrum of ages from students to elderly citizens we have citizens uh, with uh, visual impairments or other multimodal impairments there are the socioeconomic boundaries we need to take into account we have the educational community because we believe that citizen science can support education in a very good way as uh, students will have a different motivation for studying physics because they will contribute actually in real research we have citizens with low ict literacy and uh, for an online project let me tell you that this is a very uh, let's say big challenge to see how we will be able to include uh, this we have also citizens with low science capital, so to say. So actually it is our goal to also help, you know, alleviate anti-scientific beliefs in society. Another question that we have is that how can we integrate responsible research and innovation aspects in uh, our activities? We have to take into account in the design of our project uh, multiple uh, factors. Uh, for example gender equality we would like to see equal gender representation in the in our projects uh, we want to offer high quality science education not only uh, doing um, things doing science we want to offer education we know in this one we need public engagement we need to offer open access and so on so these are aspects we are talking about so to address these uh, questions, uh, the Rainforest team is actually doing a series or taking a series of steps. The first one is that uh, we are performing a desktop bibliographic research to acquire, let's say, wisdom from our predecessors in citizens. And we are in a, an online survey which we will deploy the following weeks and we would like your input in this one we will organize a series for citizens and we have also performed the task analysis of the rainforest demonstration after concluding this uh, this part rainforest will do So we will publish a citizen engagement strategy concerning the characteristics of different target groups and the special characteristics of our demonstrators. We will develop a set of requirements and offer recommendations on how to build these uh, citizen science activities. And, uh, it has been proven that citizens can actively contribute in new knowledge. They may not be discovered in gravitational waves, but they can support the optimization of these detectors and not only gravitational waves but every in a big spectrum of uh, science it is our uh, proposal that citizen science can become the through which citizens and scientists can uh, come together and discuss and interact and in reinforce we engage by designing these engagement activities let me give you one overview 
follow in the strategy, two things you expect from us in follow, three things you expect from us in the following months. The first one is the deployment of the reinforced demonstrators. Our, my colleagues will discuss immediately after. The second part is that you expect to see the development of a big community, an online community of citizens and scientists who will uh, interact with uh, each other. And the other part is that you will be able to participate in a series of participatory engagement activities from uh, science cafes to exhibitions, training workshops or webinars. You will be able to participate in this. So we would in this new fantastic journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting as always. Um, let's move on to the, the first of the uh, demonstrators then. So over to uh, Max, who's going to uh, talk about the gravitation noise hunting demonstrator. Max, I think you have your microphone muted, maybe. Okay, uh, we have an audio problem with, uh, with Max at the moment. Max, we can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Here we go. Great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so welcome, my name is Massimiliano Razzano and I am Associate Professor in the Physics Department of the University of Pisa. And I'm gonna show you the first of the demonstrators that uh, we, we are planning for, for Rainforest, so, which is related to gravitational waves. So as you know, gravitational waves are a new exciting field of physics uh, because they open a new window on the universe. So what does it mean? Well, first of all, they can uh, allow the study of, of uh, gravitational fields. Uh, they can allow the possibility of probing all the dark side of the universe, like uh, black holes and other astrophysical sources that are not emitting uh, light. They are, are good for testing general relativity and also for doing other interesting things like uh, investigate cosmology, etc. And all these things is, is coming to the context, the broader context of the multi-messenger astrophysics, which means using different traditional, different messengers, not just uh, light, but also gravitational waves and particles in order to uh, study the universe. So this is just a quick timeline to show you that from the, the, the basically gravitational waves were predicted more than uh, a century ago and then in the 60s they started some first attempts to the detection because uh, the idea is that gravitational waves have a very very tiny effect on uh, on the matter so it's very hard to detect them but in the 80s there was this, these new projects coming online which are LIGO in the US and Virgo in, in Europe uh, that were basically inaugurated and they started taking data in the around the year 2000 and uh, since 2007 they are jointly observing the sky like in Virgo and uh, in this way it was possible to advance the sensitivity of these detectors and finally in 2015 we had a first detection of, uh, of gravitational waves after more or less a century since it, the prediction and now we, we are in the new, new, new era called the era of the advanced detectors. And uh, recently we just stopped, so we just ended our third observing round uh, at the end of March uh, uh, of 2020. So what are the, the sources of gravitational waves and why it's so important to study them? Well, uh, gravitational waves, first of all, what are they? So these are ripples in space-time that travel at the speed of light, and these are produced by violent phenomena by the acceleration uh, of big masses like uh, black holes, neutron stars. And we usually classify the sources of gravitational waves in two big broader uh, classes. We have those transient sources, which are, for instance, coming for, from the inspiring and merging of compact binary systems, like for instance, two black holes or two neutron stars. And these are the sources that we have detected so far. 
But this is just the tip of the iceberg because there are a lot of other expected sources that we haven't yet observed in gravitational waves, such the supernovae, which are you know the explosion of the of the big um, stellar uh, masses at the end of the stellar life. Uh, but we also expected to see continuous sources coming from rotating neutron stars, uh, coming from a background of unresolved sources. But more interesting than that, we expect to have other sources that we don't expect right now with our with our theories. But uh, in principle, we will be able to observe also these uh, these uh, these sources, and uh, these are quite extreme sources. Uh, on the plot, you see. That the final moments before the, the merging of these two black holes, this is the first event that was detected, and you can see that the, 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 these two black holes, uh, right before they were merging, they come in together at a more or less half of the speed of light. So this is something extreme that we want to study with, with gravitational waves. Unfortunately, these gravitational waves had a very tiny signal. So uh, a passage, typically a passage of a gravitational wave induces the formation of the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters over a, a length scale of one kilometers. So it's extremely, extremely tiny. Uh, and the other problem is that we have a very high background noise because every other phenomenon that you can imagine related to everyday life, it's much, much higher than the effects uh, induced by gravitational waves. So uh, how do we detect them? Well, in the, it was this, this idea of, in, of employing the light uh, using these uh, so-called laser interferometers. So the idea is to exploit the interference of light uh, and uh, on, on a, after these lights, uh, this light beam has traveled over a kilometer long scale. And uh, after, it, you can see this in this plot, and after these two beams have traveled along orthogonal directions, they will recombine and we observe the, the, the interference of light. So we know the light is made of, of, of uh, waves, so we can observe the interference, the pattern of, of the interference. And every tiny uh, slight movement of the, of, the, of the ground, of the earth, uh, such as this one induced by gravitational waves will be detectable with these, with these things. So the, the frequency range come from 20 to 20,000 Hertz. And of course, there are a, a lot of interesting and advanced topics and techniques to, the, to remove this, this, uh, this noise. And uh, just to make uh, an example, basically uh, an interferometer like Virgo, uh, our European interferometer, that is installed close to Pisa uh, has a, as a sensitivity curve depending on the frequency exactly or at least in a similar way uh, as it happens with our here. So we can hear there is a, a something some specific uh, frequency range where our you know our uh, hearing capability is higher, etc. So uh, what is uh, what is limiting this sensitivity are different kind of noises, and this is where uh, we, we design our demonstrator because there are some kind of noise called glitches that are not stationary in time, that are not related to astrophysical sources, but can, that they mimic uh, maybe an astrophysical source. So we are, we, are, we are doing an activity called the characterization of the detector and the noise hunting, which is extremely important. And in order to uh, do this, one of the aspects is try to classify these glitches that can have a very complex morphology when you look at these, these things into the time frequency domain. And you, here you can see a couple of examples of two glitches. And uh, what we plan to use is machine learning to do this kind of a classification. So for instance, we, we plan to use uh, a standard, um, some standard machine learning techniques like uh, what is called supervised learning, where you, you start from a set of, uh, of data that are being already looked for and they are already, uh, we, we say, labeled. So like these animals, we know that this is a duck, this is a not duck, etc. And we fed these into an algorithm that eventually will come up with a predictive model that every time you give a set of data, he will say, oh, this is a duck or this is not a duck. So in, in the same way, this is a glitch or this is something else. 
And uh, Manolis already uh, already explained the, the success story of Gravity Spy. So we we plan to buy and to build a, a demonstrator which uh, will help to detect and classify glitches, but also other other set of noises. So uh, that's the idea. So this is a, a demonstrator that is being developed between different uh, uh, institutions in, in, in Rainforce. So uh, the idea is to use real data to show this real data to the citizen scientists and uh, to ask for them to look for uh, specific noise features um, and help us to build a training model to, to, to build a training data set that, it, that we can use to fed our algorithm. So the data will be presented uh, in different ways, uh, visually, by a time frequency representation, but also we plan to use audio representation in order to uh, allow more inclusion in our projects. So this is a typical uh, scheme of these very complex patterns that you can see when you look at the frequency on the, on the vertical bar versus the time, which is on the, on the horizontal bar. And if you look at the different parts, you can see glitches, you can see lines, horizontal lines, etc. So this is something that is extremely complex to look for. And this is uh, something that you can look for not just using visual, but also hearing to this pattern because this can be converted to audio. And in this way, we expect to, uh, to gain a more complex and more complete view of our detector. So the road ahead, so we already started this. So we are in a phase of developing uh, the data selection. We uh, are in a phase of creating data. And the next step will be uh, what would be the, the, the creation of uh, the developing of the machine learning algorithm and then deploying the website like on Zoo Universe and, and, uh, and then eventually in the summer of 2020 to launch the website and then to provide a comparative analysis after the end of the project. So the conclusion, we are witnessing an extremely uh, exciting field, exciting times for gravitational wave physics, and we have big amount of data. So less noise means more sensitivity, which means more advanced and more science. So this is what we ex we expect to do with our gravitational wave demonstrator. So you are all welcome to to join, and uh, we'll be very happy to share this demonstrator with you in hopefully a year from now. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Max. Um, I, just before we move on to Pascal, just to uh, quickly say, if, if anybody does have any questions, then please feel free to um, Pascal, over to you for your, for your uh, presentation. Hello, let me just share my screen. Um, does that Not yet. Not yet, no. Oh. Now? Uh, we can hear you fine. We can't see the shared screen. Okay. How is that? Uh, let me try again. Share screen. Ah, okay. Working fine now. Is that okay? We can see half of green, let's say, at the moment. Okay, fine. Put it on full. Is that good? Great. Great. Thanks. Okay. Good. So, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Pascal Boyle. I'm a physical physicist at the Centre de Physique de Parcours de, de Marseille. Um, I've been working in the field of neutrino astronomy for longer than I would like to say, and uh, I've been involved in the kilometer cube neutrino. But before talking about that, let me go back a step and just uh, remind you about uh, how up now we've done astronomy. So all these beautiful pictures that we uh, from the large optical telescopes and all for, for uh, 
that's how they're, they're all taken using uh, magnetic uh, messengers. So that could be optical light, uh, ultraviolet, infra infrared, um, radio waves, gamma rays. But uh, since about the last 20 years, we've been uh, working on a new type of astronomy, which we've called uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So instead of just using uh, electromagnetic spectrum, we expand our tools, our detectors. Uh, get the next. Yeah. Uh, to look for other particles that can be emitted by uh, these clatter cataclysmic objects in the universe. So the, as I said before, the traditional astronomy is with this photon uh, messenger. We also now have uh, developed detectors that can do astronomy with the cosmic rays. And these will mainly uh, protons. And these guys have an electric charge. So they don't actually travel in straight lines. They get bent between uh, the source and the detector on the Earth. And the guy that uh, I'm most uh, involved with is detecting particles called neutrinos. So uh, neutrinos are a uh, very enigmatic particle, which is emitted by uh, different types of objects in the sky. I'll come back to that later. So to detect uh, these new messengers, uh, we have um, the gravitational wave detectors. And uh, as Massimiliano told us, LIGO and Virgo are now successfully detecting very beautiful uh, events. All these detectors are very large, uh, Virgo, LIGO, kilometers in size. We have now very large detectors uh, also detecting the cosmic rays, uh, for example, the OJ experiment in Argentina. What I would like to focus on today are, are the neutrinos. And uh, we now have kind of uh, three or four detectors around the world which are starting to detect neutrinos from, uh, from the universe. So uh, such detectors are Antares uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, Ice Cube in the South Pole, and Kane 3Net, uh, which I'll talk about now. So neutrinos are uh, very strange particles. Um, they're a bit like an, an electron, a partner to the neutrino electron would be a partner to the electron, but it would be an electron without any charge. And no charge. Uh, that's a, a great thing for astronomy because that means uh, it's not affected by magnetic field, so it moves in straight lines. So the, 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 uh, the good thing about neutrinos is that they hardly interact with matter, weakly interacting. This means that uh, as they travel through the universe, uh, they don't get absorbed, and in fact, they even escape from the center of the stars. So with neutrinos, you can kind of inside the stars and very close to the, the black holes. But the same uh, feature is this thing about neutrinos, is that they interact so weakly. It means that we have a hard time to detect them, and uh, it means that we uh, have to build absolutely enormous telescopes to have a chance to detect uh, a few of these uh, precious neutrinos. So with the neutrinos, we're just starting now to open this new window observation uh, on the universe. So the uh, sources where we expect the neutrinos are very similar to the ones where we expect to see the gravitational waves. So usually there's a, a black hole and matter around the black hole accreting uh, and uh, that that's an able, allows to accelerate particles and then you can get neutrinos produced. So we expect them to see them from supernova remnants, uh, blazars, supernova explosions themselves, gamma ray bursts, uh, also dark matter will in principle make neutrinos. Uh, so the kilometer cube neutrino telescope uh, is a, a new project we started maybe uh, 10 years ago. 
Um, and it's in fact a, a telescope which is uh, located uh, deep at the bottom of the sea on the sea floor. Um, the project is mainly a European project, but recently we were also gathering uh, uh, collaborators from other continents. We have two sites. The first site we call Orca, that's located uh, 40 kilometers south of Toulon, south of France, not so far away from my, my laboratory. And we have another sister site uh, about 100 kilometers offshore from, from Sicily. These are all very deep at the bottom of the sea. The uh, Orca detector is 2,500 meters and uh, the uh, Arca detector is 3,500 meters deep. So this slide is a kind of uh, picture of what these detectors look like. Essentially, we have these kind of beach ball size uh, spheres um, which catch uh, the light made by the neutrino as it, as it passes through the sea. So in fact, the light doesn't really come from the neutrino, but it comes from a particle produced when the neutrino interacts. So essentially we, we put a lot of optical detectors at the bottom of the sea, and a lot of them, by that I mean a lot, so it's a kind of kilometer cube size, uh, and we, we kind of search for a flash of blue light at the bottom of the sea. So we're building this detector now, and uh, here you see, uh, so currently we, we have six of these strings of photon detectors uh, sitting at the bottom of the sea, and we've already uh, started to detect uh, the, the nutrient rays as they pass. So here you see some real data where you see the particle passing through the sea, and as it travels through the detector, uh, it makes this flash of blue light. You'll also, also notice that even when the particle, when the neutrino isn't passing through the telescope, the optical modules are detecting light. And that's, uh, as I'll show later, is what we would like to get some help for, is to understand our backgrounds to, to the neutrino signal. So because we're, we're in, in the deep sea, um, and we're trying to catch this faint flash of blue light. Uh, unfortunately for the neutrino scientists, there are other sources of light in the sea. Uh, and this comes from uh, bioluminescence organisms. So our detector will see uh, flashes of light coming from various uh, organisms, even bacteria that can produce light. Our telescope uh, also has a, uh, a large number of uh, acoustic hydrophones. Uh, in fact, the detector moves around in the sea and we have to know its position uh, at any time. So we have a kind of complex acoustic system which measures the position of all the optical modules. And with that system, we can hear all the other noise in the sea. So we have uh, nice signals of whale detections and dolphin detection using the, these hydrophones. So in fact, our project will be to study the uh, optical signals and the acoustic signals uh, from the point of the view of the, their backgrounds. Uh, so here's an example optic, optical signal uh, which shows up. This uh, is when we, we switch them on. So you see as a function of times is a, Kind of minutes and seconds on, on the horizontal axis. So every now and then we will get these kind of uh, spikes where the light, the counting rate uh, goes up uh, significantly above the kind of ambient background. And we see kind of different types of waveforms, uh, optical waveforms. Uh, maybe they last a few seconds. Optical modules go up uh, kilohertz to almost megahertz for a short period. So that is the signal from these bioluminescence organisms. Uh, so this is kind of a, a new research tool to, to study bioluminescence in the deep sea. Up to now, this has only been done uh, by taking bioluminescence organisms and putting them in a tank in a lab and then measuring their signals. So this is the first time we can see uh, optical signals directly where the organisms live. Uh, so, 
it turns out that uh, about 76% of the organisms in the deep sea will be emitting bioluminescence. And uh, for the guys that live more on the seafloor, it's about 40% that emit light. And they have uh, a lot of uh, difference from emitting this light. Uh, samples are shown here. So it could be uh, to a attract prey with a luminous lure. A defense mechanism as a kind of smoke screen to distract uh, somebody that's attacking uh, the organism. Uh, some very clever fish adapt it so that they have a blue light on their belly and that makes them less visible. They don't cast a shadow so they protect themselves from being eaten. <laughs> they also need to attract uh, um, uh, to, to reproduce. So, uh, so that's all I'll say about this. And coming to the acoustic signals. So this is an example of acoustic signal from our hydrophones. And so here you can see uh, uh, the emission frequency of the sound as a function of time. And you see there are these biosonar clicks that we can detect. Uh, these are presumably produced by the uh, whales and uh, we also have dolphins which have a slightly different whistle structure you see on the bottom left uh, the frequency going up as a function of time so this would be our uh, acoustic background uh, and in fact the acoustic background from whales is very interesting because one can understand a, an amazing amount about the uh, the geometry of the whale and uh, the signals that we detect will give information, of course, on the presence of a whale, but also how big it is, uh, what the sex of the whale is, and the age of the whale, just by looking at the biosonar signals from the whale. Okay, so we're just now starting to set up uh, the, uh, the citizen science program, um, which will help us analyze these signals um, so this will be based uh, as, as for the gravitational wave project around uh, the zooniverse which is a, a very nice web-based interface to allow citizen science to 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 help uh, projects so we're just starting now to test this out implement it like the data sets that we would need to analyze so uh, we, we therefore we we will be eyes and ears in the deep sea and help us to classify these bioluminescent optical signals and the biosonar acoustic signals. We will present uh, the citizen sites with uh, selected uh, groups of these signals, and we we would like to classify them into the, to the various types. Uh, then as we progress, we will hope to understand uh, perhaps the, the dependence and time, uh, how the populations and presence of these organisms depend on time and season and other properties of the temperature. And we'll develop also in parallel learning algorithms by these uh, backgrounds. And then we can compare how the humans do and the computer do. And improve each other so um so we're starting with this we're at the thing uh, the manpower in play to set up the uh, algorithms and the zooniverse uh, web page so we hope that you will help us to understand our, our optical and acoustic backgrounds in fact nobody's ever really looked in any detail on these on these backgrounds, um, so the, quite optimistic that we will learn a lot. Uh, it's unexplored territory. And there may be some interesting discoveries to make to be, and I'm sure it will also help us improve our, our sensitivity to neutrinos uh, if we understand backgrounds. So well, this is the first time for us. We're not quite sure. What, 
what, uh, what we will find, but uh, we hope that people will come and join us and join in the fun in understanding uh, this new, very rich data set. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pascal. No matter how many times I, I, I follow your presentations, I, I always find them fascinating. Um, while you were presenting, there were uh, we, had, we received a couple of questions. Um, uh, one from Athanasia uh, in in relation uh, to the, the the project for a one-time implementation, uh, uh, as it was put. Uh, Manolis has added. Uh, uh, to that question a lot. Uh, so, uh, Sophocles, I don't know whether either of you want to comment uh, further directly. Uh, well, actually, this uh, this is uh, to expand further at the end. If we have, if, if you would like, or we could do it now. So, uh, can I share here? Uh, actually, the, the follow problem, the connection to, to school education. The question is that uh, since these objects last typically for years, okay, how compact is the activity that uh, we propose today? Okay, so if there is a possibility for one implementation so the answer to that is yes because first the, the demonstrators of the project uh, the reinforced team will create additional activities which will be able to be implemented with uh, these activities will be connected to the curriculum and uh, there will be a variety of projects according to the school needs from short intervention one to three hours with the webinar perhaps or a discussion with a scientist to long-term projects uh, which could be semester long for example uh, these projects will have will be based on the content will be you will utilize reinforce uh, demonstration data further doing laboratory work and so on. I hope this is it. Thanks very much, Manolis. Uh, with that, I think we can move on to uh, Stelios's presentation on the search for new particles, the LHC. Over to you. I have a question. First of all, in Stavros, I want to apologize for not being earlier, uh, but uh, you know, the event. I think it went very well. Uh, I have a question. Sorry uh, for for but you you mentioned about the the whales. Uh, you can uh, distinguish the sex. Can you tell us about the frequencies? Is it like uh, the, in the humans? There is higher frequencies in the female than in the male. And I wonder, does it mean something or? I think it's, I'm not really uh, an expert on this, um, but I believe it's to do with essentially the size of the head, the, the spacing between the, the P0, the P1, the P2, and the P3 kind of de depends on the reflections inside the head of the whale. And there are some differences between the male and the female head size, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, but it was it was fun to listen. Again, thank you for the presentation. Over to you, Stelios. Hello, everybody. Can you see my slides? Yeah, no problem. Great. So I'm Stelios Angelidakis, a particle physics researcher at the University of Athens. And the project that I'm going to present to you is about particle physics and discoveries. So in this project, citizens are going to become scientists of CERN, the largest particle physics lab, in order to discover new physics with the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC, which is the most powerful collider in the world. 
here's a schematic of it. The LHC is located at the border between Switzerland and France, 100 meters below the surface of the Earth. And its name means that it's large. The, uh, the LHC has a circumference of 27 kilometers. Hadron, because it accelerates bunches of protons and hadrons in general. And collider, because it collides them. Now here's an actual view of the LHC. This is the LHC tube. And you can see that it has two vacuum pipes that are pointed at by the arrows. And inside those pipes, bunches of protons are accelerated close to the speed of light in opposite directions. Now, the pipes are made in such a way so that they intersect at exactly four points along the LHC circumference. You can see them in the, uh, in the second image. And it is at those points that the proton bunches collide at very high energy. Now what happens in these collisions? A little bit of physics. So you can see here again one of the collision points. The proton bunch bunches collide every 25 nanoseconds. A proton bunch is like a very dense cloud of protons, more than 100 billion protons. So in each collision, tens of protons, uh, about 100 protons interact. Now, I bet everybody knows this famous Einstein equation, E equals mc squared, that tells us that mass is a form of energy. So this is exactly what happens here. Um, with, and the, with the proton interactions, we get very high energy in a very small region of space. So this collision energy is transformed into matter. It gives birth to all sorts of particles, particles that we know of, but more interestingly, it could be particles that we don't know of. It was among these collisions that the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012 at the LHC. And this was a big discovery because we can now say that we understand how elementary particles have a mass and we have a solid theory for elementary particle physics. We call it the standard model. However, although this discovery was huge, we are now left with the big questions, the tough ones. And I'll give you two examples. First, we see that ordinary matter, the, the visible matter, constitutes less than 5% of the total energy in the universe. So what's the rest of it? We call it the dark matter and the dark energy. A second question. You see below this black axis, it represents the masses of all particles. On the left end, we have the, the, the particles that we know of, that we have discovered. The heaviest elementary particle is called the top quark, and its mass is about 170 GeV. Now you can forget about GeV, just remember 170. On the other end of the axis, we have what the Planck mass, which is the largest mass that a particle can have. And it's of the order of 10 to the 19 GeV. So you understand that there's a huge gap that we don't know anything about. So what exists there? What kinds, are there any particles? How do they interact? These are two of the questions that scientists are trying to answer. And we believe that citizens can join the effort. Therefore, we have designed a multiple stage project in which we will study um, real and simulated collisions from the LHC that are recorded with the ATLAS detector. Now, ATLAS is one of the large experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. And the ATLAS detector is a huge particle detector that you see on the right. And you can compare its size 
to the human size. You see the two people standing on the side of it inside the red circle here. For now, you can simply consider this atlas as a huge, as a gigantic camera that takes pictures of each collision event. We're going to study those pictures. Actually, we're going to study visual representations of those pictures, and we're trying to add oral representations of these pictures as well. And for this, we're going to use an interactive framework, the one you see on the right, showing, two, showing them a map of the atlas detector from two different angles. So you can see everything that happens in a collision event, every particle that's produced. And the whole project is going to be hosted by Zooniverse, um, which specializes in citizen science. So what we're going to do is first learn about the different kinds of particles and identify them among the collision products. This is a very important step of every experiment at the LHC, and it's called particle identification. The second stage would be to identify traces of new physics, learn what new physics signatures would look like in Atlas. And the last part would be to scan a, a very big sample of real data in order to discover new physics signatures. Actually make, try to make a discovery. This, we're very interested in this because it, it has never happened, at least not in this form, by actually looking at the events one by one. So, in conclusion, the project is going to be running in about a year from now on Zooniverse. So I'm asking you to keep your interest up because we invite all interested citizens to learn and participate in the research efforts at the LHC. At the same time, we expect that this project will also show us new ways, new, new paths in order to bring citizens inside fundamental physics research. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Stelios. We have uh, one open question uh, from uh, Istan, which we will we will discuss at the end of the the session. Okay. Um, so we can move on uh, now to our, our final uh, demonstrator presentation with uh, Jacques on cosmic muon images. Over to you, Jacques. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I cannot share my screen for time being. Okay, now it's good. Okay, did you get my screen on? Yes, we got that fine. Very good. So good morning, everybody, and thanks for the organizer to have me invited in this uh, webinar on the Reinforce. What I'm going to talk about is the possibility that we have and that has uh, recently developed uh, during the last uh, uh, 10 years of performing imaging by using uh, elementary particles, and namely the particles that we are using here are the so-called muons. And the project here is called COMICS, which stands for Cosmic Muons Images for Citizens. Uh, this is uh, actually a collaboration between uh, different uh, fields of physics, and this is uh, what we call the interdisciplinary uh, field, because it involves not only uh, particle physicists, but also a huge community in uh, uh, the geophysicists, um, and also we are working with archaeologists. So this is uh, an open field, and this is, uh, we think, perfectly uh, fitting the requirements of uh, citizen science. 
what are we doing with the so-called muon radiography? So the muon radiography, also called muography, is a muon ray imaging technique using either absorption or scattering of the particles. And uh, this technique is sensitive to the density of the matter uh, which is uh, crossed. And uh, we can say that this is exactly the equivalent of the medical X-ray imaging that you're performing in the hospital, for instance. And I will explain this a little bit uh, later on. And uh, I wanted just to show you the different fields of application of these techniques that are used uh, right now uh, in geoscience, in archaeology, or for industrial controls. And you see a few examples uh, in geoscience for volcanology, geology, hydrology, but you can also study atmospheric physics. You can also study, of course, the cosmic ray physics. In the archaeology, you've heard, I think, I'm sure, of the scan pyramid project uh, in which there was a tunnel which has been uh, discovered using this technique in the Cheops pyramid. And you can use this also for uh, tumulus in Greece, for example, or for the scanning of any anthropic structures. And uh, the industrials are right now interested in the techniques because it allows to make non-invasive controls of larger structures that you can find uh, in the industry worldwide. The idea here is that we will use the uh, cosmic muons instead of X-rays. So the muons, if I show you the uh, table of elementary particle, these are the particles that we know right now and that we think that they are elementary. This is the, the, the sketch in uh, 2020, let's say. And you see that the muons uh, uh, belong to the lepton category. This is more or less like an electron, but which is a little bit heavier and which is also unstable, which means that after a certain time, the muon will decay, giving birth to other particles. But this is an elementary particle, and how is it created? It's created by the interaction of what we call the cosmic uh, ray particles, which are mainly protons, which are bumping into the atmosphere nuclei at the top of the atmosphere. And these interactions are generating large extended air showers of particles. And this is basically what is protecting the life at the surface of Earth because the energy of the incident particles, they are, let's say, uh, shared among a lot of particles which come at the surface of Earth with less energy and which are less dangerous for our health, for example. So if uh, I want to use these particles to make the so-called absorption muon tomography, what I do is uh, summarized in this sketch, which is in the center of this slide. You have the incident muon flux, which is coming, crossing a target that is interesting you. Here in this case, this is uh, the dome uh, of an active volcano. And uh, if you put a tracker, a detector, just after the target, and you measure the absorption, the relative absorption of the incident muon flux with these detectors, then this will give you directly an access of the opacity of the target, where the opacity is basically the product of the density of the matter times the length of travel for the particles inside the target. And this is exactly what you do when you do X-ray imaging, but we are replacing the X-rays, which are photons, by other particles, which are muons. And why are we using these muons? Because uh, among all the particles that we know, the elementary particles, which are produced naturally in the atmosphere, these muons have the interesting property to cross matter, and they can cross up to kilometers of standard rocks before being completely absorbed. And this is the way that we are using this matter. So how do we track them? Uh, we track it with a, a, a detector, which is called a tracker. And in our case, we are using a scintillator-based tracker. A scintillator is uh, basically a plastic, a plastic in which you put some dopants. And when the particle is crossing the scintillator here, 
it generates a light flash and the light flash is collected inside the optical fibers and the optical fibers then drives the signal down to a photosensors. And with this, you're able to collect a collection of its within a tracker. And with the three points, basically what you do is that you uh, reconstruct a line and this line, if you select this among all possible noise sources and backgrounds that we, the, that we also record on the field, this line is giving you an idea of the uh, trajectory of the incident muons. And by counting all the muons crossing in a different, uh, in a given direction, then you reconstruct the target opacity uh, by comparing with the, uh, the situation where there is no target just in front of it. This is the basics of the, this project. Uh, here in this slide, I show you a couple of uh, applications in which we have put various type of detectors which are basically the trackers that I have described uh, just before. And you see that there are many, many, many applications uh, ranging from the volcanology where you have uh, different volcanoes, active volcanoes where we tried and where we uh, made measurements to underground application like uh, tunnel boring machines to uh, different uh, anthropic structure like Greek tumulus or to industrial applications like uh, in the nuclear plants uh, control or water tanks or a different uh, type of, uh, of uh, applications. The muons, of course, they are generated in the atmosphere, so they are sensitive to the pressure and temperature. For example, the pressure is uh, only a measure of the quantity of air molecules that we have above the head. And the more molecule we have, the more absorption there is for the muons. So the higher the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, the lower the muon flux that you record at the surface of Earth. And this is an interesting uh, way of also trying to get some information concerning the atmosphere. A recent example that we have measured here is uh, an example of uh, uh, a phenomenon which is called the sudden stratospheric warming, where you see here at the uh, time scale of the months the uh, polar vortex, which is just spinning around and making a warm situation at the latitude of uh, uh, my country in France. And uh, this has been recorded in time coincidence with the muons which have a, a larger flux because the hotter the atmosphere, then the less dense, so the more muons. So these are just a couple of examples showing you that you can uh, look with this particle with a simple technique, uh, not only to the uh, target that, you're, you, that you are studying, but also to the generic uh, properties of the atmosphere. Of course, there are a lot of uh, interest in the community of geoscience. Uh, for example, for the volcanoes, the people want to know what is the structure of a volcano. And this is actually something which is uh, quite hard because a volcano is just uh, 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 emerging from Earth uh, during an eruption. So there are a lot of stones and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, dust which are uh, projected in the atmosphere and then which are making a kind of a, a big uh, uh, jellium like this with a lot of uh, holes and folds and uh, cavities inside. And this is really hard to have a picture, an unified picture of this. And the atmospheric muon tomography is one of the recent techniques which has been, uh, let's say, which has proven that it can be efficient to have a, a really nice and complete overview of the structure of an active dome with the, all the, uh, the, the, the zones which can be, let's say, fragile and which can uh, be the, the, the site of uh, uh, future eruption. And this is something that you can operate without having an operator on site. And this is really something which is important. And here are uh, uh, other couple of, uh, of photos of uh, installation of uh, cosmic muon detectors around the, the dome of an active volcano, which is actually the Soufrière of Guadeloupe in the Lesser Antilles. 
In this slide, these are the images that uh, we can collect by putting detectors all around the domes. And you see that the images that we have are just the images of contrast between the, uh, the blue zones, which are the non-dense zones, and the red zones, which are quite dense. And with this technique, you can identify where are the faults, where are the cavities, where the gas is supposed to, um, to accumulate. And this is uh, the danger in this type of volcanoes, because if you have too much accumulate, uh, accumulation of gas and of energy, then this can be the source of uh, the so-called phreatic eruption, for example, which is uh, uh, really dangerous because this is not giving uh, many uh, precursor signals in the standard geophysic uh, detectors, such as uh, the, the seismometers, for example. So, uh, what we have discovered also is that with these techniques, by looking at the variations uh, with times with the uh, muons, we can have an access to the dynamics of the uh, matter inside the target. And here, although we may think that a volcano is just an accumulation of stones, it is full of water. And these type of uh, volcanoes, which are full of water, uh, may be uh, in different states, uh, depending on the fact that the water is uh, under vapor or liquid form. And of course, if this is a uh, vaporized vapor and that this uh, vapor is accumulating in cavities, then this is really dangerous because it's proof that the, uh, the, the full dome is under pressure. I will skip this one and just uh, uh, concentrate on uh, some uh, other applications. These are um, pictures which are taken from a Greek tumulus in the uh, region of Apollonia. And uh, you can see the, the, the small uh, white pot uh, in, the, in the picture below, which is the, the, the small van in which we put the detector, trying to make uh, uh, an image a radiography of this type of tumulus. Why is, uh, is it interesting to have this uh, uh, radiography of the tumulus? The point is that you have this uh, big amount of earth, but uh, uh, what you want to see is what is below, of course, and below you can have some tombs and you can have some uh, unidentified uh, anthropic uh, objects. And this is one of the goals of the technique to have enough resolution in order to, uh, to find this object inside the, the, the tumors. So what we are expecting now from the reinforced project, there are two parts inside our uh, proposal. The first one is to make a small demonstrator detector on the type of uh, what I've shown you with the, a simple tracker scintillator and to have this detector moved around, uh, this could be in uh, classrooms, it could be in uh, schools or university or whatever. And uh, uh, what we want to do is a plug and play detector with which you can collect the data and make your image of whatever you want. The building of your school, for example, or uh, a water tank or some uh, building which is of interest in the city. So this is something that we will uh, have uh, shared among the, the, the community. This is the first part of the project. The second part of the project is to have the citizens helping us improving the quality of the images. If I put back some uh, images that we collect on the volcano, you can see, for, for instance, that we have here big pixels, oops, sorry. We have here big pixels with the quite low resolution. And the point is that making this uh, muon imaging, you are limited by the quantity of muons that the nature is uh, sending you. And there is no way like in an accelerator or like uh, in an X-ray machine to increase the flux of the muons we, uh, that is crossing the target. And this is an intrinsic limitation of the, the resolution that you, that you can get. So what we are developing, and this will be put uh, on the Zooniverse uh, platform, is a type of uh, exercise collection in which we ask people to identify images 
and to uh, so there are different levels of expertise uh, within these uh, imaging exercises from basic to experts and for the most experts of the people we are uh, asking the people to participate in the development of algorithm which with the artificial intelligence for example or deep learning or machine learning or whatever we can improve artificially the quality of the images so these are the basics uh, of our proposal using the muon the cosmic muons and uh, you're all welcome of course to this uh, muons anting and to this uh, proposal of uh, getting better images with the cosmic muons thanks a lot thanks very much jack We'll move on with slightly over our allotted time, but we'll move into a into a question and answer. Um, we've had a, a couple of questions, uh, one from Istem and one from uh, Leonardo, and I would like to open the the, the Q and A session with with Leonardo's question, if I can, and we'll we'll come to Istem's uh, afterwards. So Le Leonardo has, has said that he's not working on a citizen science project, but rather one based on the citizen uh, the science shop approach. So in this methodology, uh, radical citizen science projects. Uh, citizens do not participate by fully fulfilling a specific request made by the scientists, but the response to a question or concern raised by citizens. Can you imagine working with the pure scientists around which Reinforce was born, some kind of research project in which citizen participate rather than data collection analysis? I'm going to open up to the panel. Um, do we have anybody, any takers? To reply to Leonard's question, uh, um, I, I could um, initiate the discussion from our part if you like, Manolis. Thanks, Manolis. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so, Leonard, thank you for very much for your question. You know, this is uh, something that we wish to do. Unfortunately, we do not believe that we can radical citizen science the way that you do in. Um, projects uh, okay or in project citizens uh, are gathering in their um, neighbor they have a problem that they wish to solve for example contamination of water or something and then they go they ask for help so they form the collaboration this part is very difficult to uh, with the direct uh, project on the other hand there is the We have it, but we also have open data to citizens. The interface of the projects allows to us to the data in a format that is analyzable, but the tasks offered and the questions asked, have, um, let's say, a difficult scale regarding the complexity of things that we we want the contribution of, of citizens to be. So, the first is that uh, there is um, a scaling here. The second is that we, as we answer to ISTEM, we have a participatory design in our, in our approach because uh, we will have a visionary workshop in which we will receive from citizens. We will have participatory engagement activities in which we will be able to communicate, receive feedback of to citizens throughout the project, and we will have a reflection works in which we will get the uh, let's say, feedback from citizens community in which there will be all this interaction uh, online. So, uh, from me, this is a part that I would like to highlight. I don't know someone from the demonstrator uh, partners who would be able to elaborate further on the work. Thanks. We the discussion point here. Um, well, yeah, this is Massimiliano. Yes, I, as Manali, uh, this is something also very open. Um, an example to, to gravitational waves. Uh, one important part of this search is uh, for, for this uh, noise hunting part, and that sometimes it happens that you find uh, some expected 
protected sword and something that we haven't yet found. So uh, a part of the website that we, we foresee is dedicated to uh, a sort of interaction or log live where people can also suggest of noises, new, let's say, for instance, new glitch types, new uh, non-transient noise type. And, uh, and in this way, we can go back to our data and see if this noise happened already. And so in some way extend uh, our knowledge just beyond what we know already. So this is something that uh, definitely we'll, we'll probably be able to implement. Thanks, Max. Do we have any any further contributions on uh, on Leonardo's question? If not, I would like to lead on from Max's uh, response because I think in part it also relates to the question from Istan, which I'll, I'll just read now, just to to bring it to your attention. So. Uh, the presentations so far have been from the from fields that require big data and the involvement of citizens at the level watching the data collection capacity. Could you elaborate a bit more? There are two questions basically. A about different what citizens are being involved in your projects other than data collection. And your interest scientists from other fields where the structure of citizen science involvement be quite different. It's like to reply. Uh, in relation to point to question A, in re relation to work package um, of of the demonstrators, uh, I think it's more data characterization than than data collection. We are from what Max was was just saying. Uh, we're looking at these in which we can bring citizens. Uh, Character, uh, characterizing the, these noise sources. We're looking at ways in which we can bring them ever, ever, ever to, to the interface. We would like to uh, bring them uh, technology into the workflow of, of the control room almost, or of the detector characterization group uh, within, within Virgo. Um, and so we're kind of, we're, exp we're still quite, you know, uh, early stages, but ways in which we can we can, we can get over the fact kind of stop at the, the, the characterization phase and they're outside of the door and we're trying to bring them into the actual uh, research workflow um, we working on that field um, are there any is there anybody on the, the panel who would like to um, uh, to follow up on, on either of the questions from Istan? Yes, Jack uh, from the the muons. I think that uh, what what you just said is really uh, an important point. Uh, we are proposing here more a data characterization than a data collection. Data collection is uh, the job, let's say, of the the, the different collaboration uh, and demonstrators and so on and so forth. What we are really looking at uh, here is just uh, let's say a different an alternative view to the data and to the way we systematically analyze the data and reduce the backgrounds and so on. This is something that uh, could benefit from uh, uh, different expertise uh, from different uh, fields of, of work. Uh, for instance, the, 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 the problematics that I have mentioned here for the muons and for the, uh, the fact that we have uh, limited statistics is something which is known in the, in the world as uh, a problematic of sparse data. And sparse data is exactly what Netflix uh, when it has to propose to any consumer the best choice for him. Uh, and it has here with uh, uh, to deal with the matrix of uh, different movies and uh, uh, the different cu customers gave rates to some of the movies and the Netflix people and the Netflix algorithm, they have to fill the gaps uh, in order to find what would be, and to guess, what would be given the rates, the few rates that I have, the few weight, uh, ratings that I have on a few movies, what file of this consumer and what do I 
to propose him in order that he has to consume uh, much more. Here and they are uh, uh, and non scientific. of research, of course. And this is the way that we have the better, uh, let's say, mutual improvements in between research science from one side and a uh, citizen from the other side. The, uh, at least this is one of uh, uh, the possible applications. Thanks very much, Jacques. Yeah, right at the end of our time now, there's a, a, a one final comment. Uh, on the, the Q&A from Paula uh, in relation to Reinforce producing a series of citizen science, project, science projects bringing this cutting edge research closer to society. One of the most prominent target groups is that of students. So utilizing the scientific data of the demonstrators, a set of edu dedicated educational resources will be created, will be adapted to effective school curriculum, will be implemented at scale with students in Europe. Uh, Paula, would you like to, uh, uh, do you have audio? Would you be, uh, uh, would you like to say anything further on this? Okay, uh, I'm presuming that the, you don't have the, the audio connection there, Paula. But thanks for the point anyway. I, I tried to invite... Ah, okay, yeah. Paula, we can hear you. We can hear you. Please, please Yes, come. I was sending the real question. This was just an introduction. First, I want to thank you, all the speaker and the organizer. It's a very bright uh, presentation. So thank you so much. Um, what about in future is uh, just a proposal uh, because it's uh, the day after the six uh, success about using the International Space Station um, for uh, giving also lessons on these uh, innovative uh, gravitational waves, let's say revolutionary tools that you are presenting and having their more citizen science engagement. Voila, we did it in the past. Uh, so uh, I am, uh, of course, uh, glad to help in this sense. We could get organized about that. For giving lesson and uh, it will be worldwide about diffusing gravitational uh, waves innovative revolutionary tool for uh, this purpose is uh, an idea thank you very much paula thank I... you very much thank you very much indeed um i think we've reached the end of our our time now we've, we've actually we've gone well well beyond the the end of our our planned time um please if anybody wants any further contributions then uh um you speak now or forever hold your um, uh, yeah, if not then we can always follow up offline thanks very much to everybody for attending and following the uh the webinar this morning and um, those who've taken part and organized and um we look forward to to engaging with you again in the future uh reinforce uh program and we hope you uh, you follow uh, and support our, our progress uh, through the the Zooniverse and, and other platforms. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, enjoy the rest of uh, the rest of the the day, which is a public holiday here in Italy. So tomorrow is a public holiday here in Italy. So for those of you here, enjoy your ponte. Uh, okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ciao. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.